The key thing to remember is that culture is not static. It's dynamic. It moves. It's complex. All right. Um, something, as, as Lori mentioned, culture is not something that can be reduced to just stereotypes. All right. Because culture changes all the time. Culture is a result of particular times in our history, particular eras and periods. Sometimes these changes are drastic, sometimes they're subtle. But the point is, culture is dynamic. It is not static. One of the primary ways in which historically culture has been uh, examined is through this idea of cultural competency, right? And cultural competency or the method of cultural, cultural competency does have some benefits. It does give you an understanding of different cultures. It does help you identify your own biases and prejudices. And it does help you begin to um, develop respect for people of other, other cultures. However, the problem with cultural competency, particularly for those of us who work in education, is this idea that at some point I can be competent in cultural identity. I can be competent in appreciating culture. Meaning once I'm competent, once I check the box, once I get the certificate, I have completed my training. I have completed my learning, right? So we have this intuitive understanding of when you have the word competent that you can reach an endpoint. And then that retires and negates our uh, inclination to continue to learn. And this is where we landed at the culture of humility. Now, culture of humility, the technical definition is the ability to maintain an openness to the other, to be other orientated in relation to aspects of cultural identity that are most important to the person. The three main, I guess you want to say, um, emphasis, focus points when we talked about our definition or understanding of cultural humility is that number one, a cultural, cultural humility or the approach to culture uh, humbly means that we recognize that first of all, this is a lifelong learning process. And this lifelong learning, it's not about learning about the other per se, it is a self-evaluation and self-critique of ourselves in relationship to the other. When we talk about culture of humility, particularly, again, in a teaching environment, um, we have to recognize that despite how rebellious some of uh, the young men and women that we are been charged to form may be, they still recognize you as an authority. So immediately in those situations, there is a power imbalance. Even when you're dealing with their parents, particularly if you are in a position of administration in the school, but anywhere in our institutions, there is an intrinsic power imbalance that they perceive. Therefore, as one who approaches um, dealing with different cultures through the process of cultural humility, you recognize that and you work towards balancing out that power imbalance, or even the perception of that power imbalance. And the last piece is you always have a commitment to develop a relationship and partnership with any marginalized community in the community that you are serving. Which means when we say any marginalized community, we're talking beyond just race. We're talking all the isms. Racism is one of them, but we're also talking about classism. We're talking about sexism. Right? We're talking about all the different isms that's out there in your community. Whoever is the most marginalized, whoever is the most vulnerable, through the culture of humility, you recognize and make a commitment to develop relationships with those groups. By the end of the day, right? I said we'll say in the middle of the day, we had been, we compared, and I presented this chart of a comparison between cultural competence and cultural humility. 
what I want to emphasize today is that last comparison. One of the most dangerous results of working through a method of cultural competence versus cultural humility, because of that endpoint, because of that belief that at some point we will be confident or competent uh, and have a end point of learning, we start to categorize individuals' cultures, which means we start making assumptions about traits, about practices, about behaviors, which creates and promotes stereotyping. Now, I believe that everyone here on this call, I'm believing in God. No one wakes up that morning and says, you know what? I'm just, I'm going intentionally, okay? Operate from a position of stereotyping and dividing people up into groups and, and, and be discriminating. I don't think anyone on this call does that. However, if we approach um, dealing with other cultures through the method of competence, you can unintentionally operate in that method. And so what I wanna talk about today is one of the aspects that is a result of working uh, through cultural competence versus cultural humility, and that is implicit bias, all right? Implicit bias. This is probably not going to work again, so we're just going to talk about it. Uh, so unmute your mics. Let me know. When I say this is initial, so we're going to build up a definition of implicit bias uh, this morning. But before we do, I'm interested, when, when you hear bias, and think about in your institutions, when you think about implicit bias, tell me what definitions come to mind. If I was to say to you, what does bias mean? What does implicit bias mean? Um, in your schools or in the classroom? What would be some examples? What would be uh, the definitions that you would share? I think it's often stereotypical comments or actions that come out that are part of your normal every day. They just come out. They just happen because you don't even realize. And I find that mine are based on lack of exposure. Mm -hmm. so, so it could be um, unconscious comments that, that, that are made, okay. I think it comes also from uh, your set of beliefs and values and experiences um, of your life. And, you know, it's very unconscious. How many of you guys used to watch the A team and, and the guy used to always say, I love it when a plan comes together. I'm loving it. Just keep on talking to me. I love when a, this is working out perfectly. Uh, so, so, so give me a few, give me a little bit more. What, what are some of the, um, when you think bias, I mean, these are good. So we got our comments that happen um, unconsciously. And then from those comments probably come from, um, like the young lady said, from our experiences that we had before, right? So from the information that we have available in our minds, we then develop these ideas and they just kind of come out unconsciously, right? What are some other um, either instances or you would say is a definition of implicit bias? I think sometimes they continue because people don't know how to engage in meaningful dialogue. Like, they just don't know how to bring it up or how to facilitate that. Um, and that may be because they're coming from a place of naivety or hesitancy. Absolutely. I think that um, obviously biases continue when they're not addressed. And why are they not addressed? How many of you grew up in a home where there were just certain topics you just didn't talk about in the house? Right? I mean, <laughs> um, my, my wife, I, I mentioned the last time um, I was here that my wife was from Scotland, met her when I was in the military. And I mean, her father used to, you know, this is someone who was a train. I'm, in my formation, I am not an educator first, or at least I am a theologian. That's my background. So imagine me going to your house in a house where the father says, we don't talk about religion in this house. <laughs> we don't talk about politics in this house. 
and we don't talk about race in this house. And I'm like, well, I guess I ain't got nothing to say. I mean, and that's 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 because that's what I do. Okay, that, that's what I do. But like Stephanie just said, I think the majority of homes they just don't have the conversation, right? And so then it, it's harder to broach it. And uh, even if you even if you hear it, and you're like, mm, that does that didn't feel very. I wasn't really comfortable with what was just said. You don't know what to say, right? <laughs> Especially if it's in your inner circle. So absolutely, these are all excellent examples um, and instances of implicit bias. I'm gonna give you guys, show you guys a slide and I want you to figure out the equation as quickly as you possibly can. Now, I'm hoping and everybody on this call anyway, since all y'all work in education, y'all should already have the answer to that question. I'm hoping nobody has their shoes off right now trying to figure out what two plus two is, right? The moment you saw the slide, you immediately came up with an answer. I mean, it was boom, it's, it's, it's four, right? All right, so I'm, now I'm gonna show you another slide. Now, this one, except for those of you who may have, you know, math was your focus, okay? Most of us right now, we know we can figure it out, but it's gonna take a few more processes for us to figure it out, right? Some of you, okay, the experiment's over because some of you right now are still looking down. So there's no test, you, you can stop. The, the point has been made right there, okay? It takes a little bit more to, uh, complete this formula, all right? Let's see, let's, let's do another one. Um, oh, here we go. What? See, this isn't gonna work. Uh, all right, so if you look, you, you see that picture? Let me see if I do this right. This picture right here. Tell me which line is longer. The top one or the bottom one, right? We've probably seen this before. So. You know, my 10 year old, I did this to him the other day and he said 100% the bottom one is definitely longer, right? That's definitely long. He even pulled out a tape measure and was like, oh, wait a minute. Uh, they are the same, right? <laughs> Immediately though, when you first look at it, even though we know what the answer is, right? But what is it? What was your first intuitive thought? It was the bottom, right? The bottom one is longer. Oh, wait a minute. All right. So I'm about to put this picture up. I'm going to give you five seconds. Five seconds to so look at this picture. And I want you to tell me what you see in this picture. All right, here we go. Ready? Go. Five to one, five to two, five to three, five to four, five to five. All right. Unmute your mics and tell me what did you see? I saw Jesus first. Saw Jesus first. All right. So that, so Jesus. Any what else did someone else see? Um, there was uh, there was depth to the image. It's of people kneeling and gathering with spears. <laughs> okay. there was a, I think there was a donkey or a, I think it was a donkey. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, we're talking about Jesus, right? So probably we're, to we're talking about him riding into Jerusalem. Because if you really look at the picture, what is his, his, his hair, it actually is an arch that he's walking mm -hmm. riding through, right? So you have, you have these different images within the image, right? But all of right. us, what's the first thing you saw? Was Jesus picture of Jesus? Right, you saw a picture of Jesus. That was that was easy. That was intuitive, mm -hmm. right? And then you had to dial in to see the details of the other picture. What mm -hmm. point am I trying to make with these examples? In our minds, we have two systems of reasoning. The first system, the system is intuitive. It's automatic. It's fast. It's instinctive. All right. The moment we see something, we reason and we come to a conclusion. 
our minds also work in a different set of reasoning. That reasoning is much more controlled. It takes effort. It's deliberate and it's reflexive. We always have these two systems of reasoning operating in our minds. Now, the first system working in conjunction with the second system oftentimes comes up with what is called heuristics. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that make it easier for us to make decisions, all right? Examples of heuristics is when you say, uh, well, I'm making an educated guess, or it's just common sense, right? The whole idea of common sense is heuristics. You shouldn't even have to think about it, it's common. Um, when you say something is a rule of thumb, or I got a gut feeling, right? This, these are all examples of heuristics. Every day we work with three different types of heuristics. Now these heuristics, for the most part, this is actually a good thing, right? Because in most cases, these mental shortcuts they're quite advantageous, right? Who wants to sit there and try to figure out um, in a deliberate thought on every single thing we do all day long, right? So in most cases, these mental shortcuts are beneficial. However, in some cases, they are not. There are three types of heuristics that we use unconsciously when we are dealing with people, whether that be children or whether that be adults. The first is called availability heuristic. Availability heuristic. The second is called representative heuristic. And the last, is confirmation bias. We're going to go through all three and see, we're gonna do some, some exercises to see if you can identify these heuristics. First, availability heuristic. This mental shortcut is what we use when we judge the probability of events by how quickly and easily examples come to our mind. When those examples come to your mind, you make decisions based on the availability of the information that is in your mind, all right? That's a mental shortcut. You see something, you're basing on the information that you have and you make a decision. That's, so in other words, it's, you're basing it on information that is available. The problem is that the most of us are exposed to a very small fraction of all the information that is to be had. And as a result, we can jump to unreasonable and quite frankly, inaccurate judgments based on the information that we have received, okay? There's usually a lot more information than what you have been exposed to. For example, these images are the stereotypical images of black men. Looking menacing, having beards. I mean, I got a beard, so that's not all bad, but having beards, wearing hoods and looking, um, we'll say antagonistic. These are the stereotypical images that you find of, of, of black men. What you don't see a lot of are images of black men with their families, images of black men graduating from universities or images of black men in professional positions. Because of the lack of imagery, because of the lack of exposure, 
of seeing young black men in this, um, in what's picture before you now, and you see them much more often in the other pictures, it can unfortunately lead to when you have to make a decision based on available information, you unconsciously make a decision based off of what the media or what society generally, typically um, presents young black men to be. This is an example of using an availability heuristic, which can create unconsciously implicit bias. Any questions or things you want to share before we move on to the next um, heuristic? Does this make sense to you? Do you have some pushback? Anything you want to express? I will say this is not necessarily, um, so in other words, this availability heuristic is not only effective to the white community outside of the communities of color, it actually also affects even the communities of color because the availability, even what they have of what they've been expressed to or experienced is the same information everyone else has. So it creates, remember last time we had the video of the young children who right away, even as a young child, felt this internal oppression that they were less than. This continues to happen throughout life when you have these different images, right? It creates information that is only a fraction, but that's what's available. And then we make decisions based on that. The other heuristic is called representative heuristic. The representative heuristic is a mental shortcut that employs the use of past experiences to guide decision-making. So availability was based upon the small information that is available to us to consume. Representative heuristic is the small, excuse me, the small information that is there based on your past experiences. Now we're about to do a, a, uh, a uh, exercise. I do not want you to unmute and tell me um, what your response is, but I want you to think about it and be honest in your own self-evaluation. I am going to present you the picture of two young men, and then I'm going to read to you a description and you tell me which one is Rob. Rob attends a private Catholic high school. He is on an education voucher and travels to school by bus every day. He loves listening to rap music and in his spare time, he is always found playing basketball. Which one is Rob? Now, perhaps due to your experience, if someone were to, again, don't tell me, this is just a self-evaluation, but be honest. If someone said to you, hey, I need you to go grab Rob. Who was Rob? Oh, Rob, um, he goes to the private high school, um, but he's on an education voucher and he drives in from town. He loves basketball. You went into a room and they said, one of these two guys is Rob. Who would you automatically assume is Rob? Now, some, would say, okay, based upon the fact that he's on an education voucher, based upon the fact that he loves basketball, based on the fact that he has the bus in, Rob is probably the Af young African-American man. That's called, that, that is using representative heuristic. Why? Because in your schools, perhaps you have a large contingent of students who fit that those descriptions or those characteristics who happen to be African-American. But guess in this picture, guess which one is Rob? The white male is Rob, right? So we wanna be careful not to use that representative heuristic. It can create 
an implicit bias that you didn't even know that you had. The last is called our confirmation bias. Now confirmation bias is a tendency, this is almost like a pyramid. It's a tendency to take the bias that you have from the small amount of information that you have available, as well as the bias that is there from your experiences, you take these the devices that you have, and now you tend to look for ways to confirm the bias by looking at situations and interpreting them in a specific way, interpreting them to favor or look for instances to recall information in such a way that it confirms your pre-existing belief or bias. A visual representation is kind of like this. When you are, and again, this can be unintentional. When you are attempting to confirm a bias, when an incident happens, you're not really seeking objective facts. What you're looking for is evidence to support and exist that you had before. What you tend to do in that situation is remember details, specific details that confirm your bias. But the other details of the situation, you tend to not notice, all right? So your information, any information that challenges your belief, you either dilute, or you tend to ignore. And again, please understand, this can happen unconsciously. You can literally be sitting there because you have these biases, you won't notice certain details, but you will notice others, okay? This is information, uh, or this is the, the collecting of information to confirm a previous bias. To give you an example, Let's say <laughs> you get your list of students that you have in the class, or you receive word you have a student or a family that is moving to your area, to your school. And let's say you've been given the impression from your colleagues that a particular family or a particular student they're going to be an issue this upcoming semester, right? Let's say you had a colleague from another school say, ooh, you got the Smiths, baby. They, they was a handful when they were with us. One day there's a disturbance and the disturbance takes place in the classroom near one of these students that you were told is possibly gonna be an issue. You question the student he denies having anything to do with the disturbance. Do you begin to search for information to confirm what you had already heard? Or are you really looking for objective facts in the situation? Are you looking to confirm a bias that bias that is there? Or are you looking to remedy the classroom in or remedy the issue in the classroom. Do you find yourself, and again, this is only, this can only come from self-evaluation. Do you find yourself remembering issues with some students while you can't recall ever having an issue with another student, all right? Do you have a student who tends to stand out all the time in class for all the wrong reasons? Not that I'm saying there aren't students that are like that, but we have to make sure that we're not noticing that simply because we're trying to confirm a pre-existing belief or pre-existing bias. If you are, then that is um, using the heuristic confirmation bias. So when we define 
implicit bias. Implicit bias is when we have unconscious attitudes or beliefs about people or when we associate stereotypes with particular groups. This is implicit bias, right? And these unconscious attitudes or these beliefs oftentimes comes from our mind's attempt to use that reason of uh, the system of reasoning that is effortless, right? That is instinctive. And it does that through heuristics. And these heuristics, though for the most part, we get through life and they're a wonderful thing, when we're dealing with people, we want to be careful that we are not using any of these heuristics, whether it be availability, representative, or confirmation bias that causes us to um, jump to inaccurate assumptions and conclusions and develop stereotypes about particular groups. This is incredibly painful, not only for your own self-development, but particularly because you are educators, it can create very um, hostile learning environments and dangers for your students. One of the dangers that oftentimes goes unnoticed was mentioned very early on um, by Lori. The technical term for that is microaggressions. Microaggressions. I'm gonna give you the definition here of microaggressions and then I have a couple videos that I wanna to show to you that I um, got from the Wisconsin Technical College on microaggressions. Here microaggressions can be de defined as the everyday verbal, nonverbal, and environment, environmental slights, insults, sometimes intentional, most of the time unintentional, which communicate negative messages that target people based on their marginalized uh, belonging to, a, to the community, all right? These can be, like I said, some of them are verbal, but even the verbal are unconscious in most cases. Some of them are nonverbal. Some of them are just from certain body movements. Um, and other things are quite are environmental. What do I mean by environmental? Um, when we went to, COVID, due to COVID, we started having to adjust the way we teach. Um, when you start, if you if you and your institution started making, I say everyone's going to go remote. What could be a microaggression is that the assumption that everyone has the capability to go remote. Right, that's a microaggression. It's unintentional. You're trying to just take care of the kids, right? You're trying to take care of the babies. But the point is, we can forget that perhaps there is a group who does not have the ability whether it be financially or, or the technology to be able to go remote. So if you are, if you miss that, that is an environmental microaggression, it is a environmental slight. I want you to pay attention to these two videos, the first, the very short. The first video defines a little bit more about what microaggressions are. And the second kind of goes to what Stephanie was mentioning earlier is how do you respond? to microaggressions. Now I'm going to believe that this is gonna work. Let me know if you cannot hear it. You did really well on the skills check off today. I was pleasantly surprised. Since I was a kid, I've always known I've wanted to do this. 
Consider a time you've witnessed an interaction that left you feeling uncomfortable because it implied that someone or a group wasn't capable or expected to be successful. This interaction is called a microaggression. Microaggression is a term used to describe remarks or actions that imply negative associations and insults toward an individual or group. These are often directed at members of historically marginalized groups. People are often unaware that the impact of their words and actions can have such harmful consequences. This video is part one of a two-part series designed to empower you to notice and interrupt microaggressions. Every microaggression students and staff experience adds to their load. One unintentional comment may seem insignificant, but these comments and experiences can get very heavy. By creating a better understanding of microaggressions and how to stop them, WTCS faculty, staff, and students will create a more inclusive and safer learning environment for all. So, how can you help address microaggression when you see it happening? When you notice microaggressions occurring, interrupt the situation. You could 1. Ask questions to get at any underlying assumptions. Thanks. Why did that surprise you? 2. Acknowledge what happened to the person affected. I heard that comment and it didn't feel right. 3. Be an active bystander and explain to the person saying or behaving in a harmful way why their actions had a negative impact, even if unintentional. You did really well on the skills check off today. I knew you would. Addressing microaggression is an ongoing process. You can start right where you are today. For additional resources or information on microaggressions, please contact the WTCS Office of Student Success. So let's talk about this for a moment before we move on to the next video. The suggestions, well, first of all, um, if you notice how subtle microaggressions can be. And I like how the animators there uh, sh showed immediately the response of the person receiving the microaggression. A lot of times, if you notice in each of those examples, and this is true in life, when the microaggression takes place, the person who receives it is not going to say anything. And they certainly are not in a situation where you are in a school, especially if you are the administrator or the principal, or the teacher, right? So you can feel that hit, but then they don't say anything back. If you notice when it talked about how to address them, um, one of the th ways you, that it mentioned to address is if you overhear it, to say to the person who it was said to that you heard it um, and that you acknowledge the fact that that was inappropriate. For those of you who are administrators, in the schools, that is going to be dramatically helpful in the environment, in the institution. To hear the leader say, you know what, I heard that and I found that unacceptable. That in itself, particularly if you have, so if you have a it's situation in a school, you already know it's happened. Instead of waiting for the parent to contact you, if you reach out to the parent and say, I, I, this is my understanding of what happened, I understand that that was inappropriate. That right there will show you, that you are trying to, first of all, remedy the situation and reconcile the relationship between the institution and the family, right? That is, going, that, that is a huge step. Any questions about, at this point, on how to address microaggressions? We're gonna talk about, we're gonna be talking about this for a minute, but I always like to check in in the middle. Is there any questions? Okay, well, let's move on here to this next video, which goes a little bit further. In video one, we defined microaggression and provided three strategies for interrupting them when they come up. Ask questions to get at any underlying assumptions. Acknowledge what happened to the person affected. Be an active bystander and explain to the person saying or behaving in a harmful way 
why their actions had a negative impact, even if unintentional. Microaggressions can be subtle and occur despite our best intentions. How do we know if we are saying and doing things that are harmful to others? In this video, we offer reflection questions to help us examine our own participation in microaggressions. What was my intention? What assumptions are behind what I said or did? What was the impact? Where are you from? From right around here. Yep, me too. But where are you really from? Um, me? Um, I was born and grew up here, in Wisconsin. The intention of this question might be to connect with someone new, but the underlying assumption is that this person doesn't look like they are from here, and the impact is they may feel othered or question if they belong. Microaggressions can invalidate or exotify someone's identity or imply stereotypical expectations, even when intended to be complimentary. Have you heard or even said any of these common microaggressions? What might the intentions, assumptions, and impacts be of each? Wow, you're so articulate. I feel so OCD today. Don't make him angry. He's a veteran. I can't say your name. I'll just call you Jay. Can I touch your hair? You want me to say they, them, or theirs when you're clearly a woman? Do you need a translator? You'd be prettier if you smiled more. If you're unsure why some of these statements can be considered microaggressions, use this as an opportunity to self-educate. What other microaggressions have you witnessed, experienced, or participated in? Noticing and addressing microaggressions is an ongoing process. By using these strategies and reflection questions, we can create a more inclusive environment for everyone. For additional resources or information on microaggressions, watch Microaggressions in the Classroom by Dr. Yolanda Flores Neiman on YouTube. Did you guys notice that one of the one of the traits, unfortunate traits of microaggressions is that the questions that you are asking could actually be your intention is to actually get to know them better. Your intention could be, I'm trying to be inclusive, but unfortunately you're asking questions that is actually making them feel more distant than they originally did, right? That's, that's why this is a continuing work. This is why it has to be something that you continue to educate yourself on because you can have the best intentions. For example, it gave the example of the person, you know, obviously someone of, it, it appears that they were trying to um, animate someone who is of Asian descent, right? And so he asked her, where are you from? And she said, I'm from here on here. Well, where are you really from, right? I mean. He may have sincerely been trying to get to know the person, but you say it in such a way that they start to feel, well, maybe I don't belong here, right? Which is unintentional, but it's, even though it's unintentional, it doesn't change the fact that it was damaging. And one thing about microaggressions, um, one of the illustrations I've heard in the past is, if you can picture in your mind, let's say you are going to a reception Right? Let's say COVID is over and we back to partying, right? And you go into a reception and you're walking in, but you don't, you have in your mind, I got, there's a, there's a level of personal space. I don't like people getting too close. And you walk into this reception and people are just getting into your space, right? So you, you move a little bit and someone else gets in your space. Sometimes people are coming into your space intentionally. Sometimes it's by accident. By the end of the night, you are so frustrated because people just kept entering into your space. You didn't say anything, but there's a loss of energy from the end of the night. You didn't really enjoy yourself because people were just in your space the entire time, but you carried it all night. Imagine if that is your student in the classroom. And every time they come in, there's this microaggression directed towards them. 
there's some some and imagine if it's a instructor teacher that they have all year that never has been asked to address this microaggression what environment are you creating for the student by the end of their time in that class what would be their experience of education what would be the environment that they were given to try to learn it right so this is what we mean by microaggression. This is what we mean um, by having to continue to work at this. What are some of the examples of microaggressions that you have, that you could be have in your classroom? One of the most common is failing to learn to pronounce or you continue to mispronounce the name of a student after they have already corrected you. The first day is a gimme, okay? You do an attendance, you're calling on names, and you, you, you're trying to pronounce the name correctly. Once they tell you, well, this is how you say my name, and you continue to go day after day after day of saying the name wrong, that is a microaggression. Because every time you say that person's name wrong, they could have a feeling that maybe I don't belong here, all right? That's a microaggression. Another microaggression, this is based upon that, those heuristic uh, shortcuts, is that you set low expectations for certain groups from particular, or for certain students from particular groups or from particular neighborhoods. Well, they're from the West Side, so we don't, we don't, we don't expect much, all right? That is a microaggression, and it's actually a disservice to the student. If you avoid calling on or engaging one class of student or one race of student or a student that has a disability because you don't wanna deal with the disability or have to deal with the extra step, that is a microaggression. If you single students out in class because of the background. And what I mean, again, this could be an example of your, you almost overcompensating for example, um, during February, during Black History Month, um, you start paying extra attention to the African-American student in the class. Or you automatically assume, hey, um, we want to do a project on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm going to sign it to you, right? That's singling out a student in class based upon their background. Your intention may be good, but it can also be a microaggression. The last one, especially over the past couple of years, um, and especially in the higher grades, is expressing, expressing political opinions, especially racially charged political opinions, assuming that the students in your class um, don't have an opinion that is opposite of that. So again, this could be an, again, an overcompensation. So let's say the assumption uh, that every African-American student, um, this happened to me when I was um, going to my undergrad. Um, they assumed, they made the assumption that I agreed with everything President Obama did. Anytime something came up about President Obama, they would say something about President Obama, they look at me like, right? That's a microaggression. You're making an assumption based upon my background that I'm automatically going to fall in line. Now, I'm not making a political statement, by the way. Um, I'm just using it as an example. So please don't write nobody and say, Carrie was in here promoting one thing or the other. That's not my point. The point is, is that you can make an assumption based on the background of, a, of an individual of what their political position could be, right? Or you can make a comment and this could even be an offhanded comment about a political or social issue that is racially charged, assuming the others in the classroom do not have an opinion either opposite of yours or um, have an opinion that they haven't expressed, but now they have fear of expressing it. 
right? We want to be careful of those uh, microaggressions. One thing the video didn't talk about much, and I don't have examples here, are nonverbals. All we've been talking about is verbal microaggressions. They're also nonverbal microaggressions. Nonverbal microaggressions would be a student comes up to you and says, uh, Ms. Smith, I have a question, and you roll your eyes because they have a question at the top of every hour. I understand it can be frustrating. I can understand it, you can grow weary. But if you have that eye rolling, it can be taken as a microaggression, all right? Those are nonverbals. Um, and then we've already talked about some of the environmental. I wanna introduce to you another danger of implicit bias that I'm not sure that you've heard of. This is called um, what's called a stereotype threat. Now, the way we work socially is our brain seeks to minimize threat and maximize, uh, I guess you want to say, the gooey feeling of welcomeness, right? So if you're in the classroom, that means you're going to minim minimize any situation which causes anxiety. But you're going to maximize opportunity to connect with people. If a student is in an environment where they feel it is hostile, they will, they will literally begin to shut down cognitively. Not only will they shut down cognitively, they literally can have a physical reaction to the anxiety. If they don't feel safe, then they can actually begin to clam up in the classroom. How many of you have had students that you've heard from their parents? Now, <laughs> now, I know I'm about to say this, and I know everybody thinks their child is an angel, okay? But I'll even say my own testimony. There's been times where teachers have been like, um, your son, this is this, I'm not exaggerating. My son, one day, I don't know what was wrong with him. He walked up to the teacher. He had two markers in his pocket, and he walked up to the teacher and said, draw. And he literally started drawing all over her paper. Right. I don't know what I don't know what happened to him. I don't know what was going on that morning. But when she told me that, you know, what my response was my son never does anything like that. I had to catch myself. I immediately jumped to oh, something. Something must have happened in the classroom. Right. But the point is, children will actually act out if they do not feel <clears throat> that they're in a socially safe environment. This can also result in what's called stereotype threat. You're gonna watch this video. It's going to explain to you what stereotype threat is, and then I'm gonna talk about it a little bit more. Meet Jane. Jane is 90 kilograms and overweight. All her life, she's been told being overweight makes her unattractive. So she hides her figure by wearing baggy clothes, doesn't wear makeup, and pays no attention to her appearance. This is Mary. Mary is 54 kilograms and slim. She feels confident of the way she looks and enhances her assets by wearing makeup, tailors her dresses, and wears heels that accentuates her long legs. Wherever she goes, she makes heads turn. And here comes Tom, a man both women find attractive. Now, if you were Tom, whom would you choose? Most people would pick Mary. But why? Is it just because Mary is slim? What if Jane pays more attention to what she wears and how she carries herself? Would you pick Jane then? Overweight people are unattractive. Men are better at math. Women are bad drivers. These are familiar stereotypes. But what if you get stereotyped over and over again? Do you start to internalize the negative characteristics associated with the stereotypes and actually allow them to become self-fulfilling prophecies? This is what psychologists call stereotype threat. In 1995, 
American psychologists Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson put this theory of stereotype threat to the test. They conducted four rounds of experiments involving African-American and white college students from Stanford University. Students took a difficult test in the first two experiments and completed a task in the third. When they were told that the test of the task was a measurement of intellectual ability, African-American students perform worse than their white counterparts. However, when the tasks were described as not diagnostic of ability, their performance equaled that of their white counterparts. To reinforce the impact of the stereotype threat, the psychologists conducted the fourth experiment. Students had to fill in a personal information questionnaire before the test. The questionnaires were all identical, except that on some, the final question asked participants to indicate their race. The main aim? To see if the stereotype of African Americans being less intelligent actually affects their test score. So, how did they perform on the test when presented with feelings of stereotype threat? Those who had indicated their race before the test performed poorly. Those who did not have to indicate their race prior to the test fared better. According to Steele, an individual does not have to believe in the stereotype to be vulnerable to it. His research suggests stereotypes are self-fulfilling in nature. When a person performs badly in an area they are stereotypically supposed to be bad at, they might think the stereotype is true and perpetuate it further with that performance. Now, if poor Jane hadn't believed that being overweight was unattractive, would she have had a little more confidence to be friends with Tom? How about you? What stereotypes are keeping you from getting what you really want? And does the sheer belief in these stereotypes stop you in your tracks? Stereotype threat is a direct result of implicit bias. You believe this is this is a situation where the in this case the student um, believes so much or has heard so much the implicit bias that they actually fulfill that bias. Um, it's almost like a psychological internal weight um, that is there. If they're told, um, for example, you call them up and say, you know what, I want to help you um, increase your ability in a particular math equation. The insinuation that they do not have the ability to do it actually goes up there with them and they can actually fulfill that expectation, all right? This is a, is a tremendous danger to the learning environment. Remember what we just said earlier, that the brain seeks, or the brain wants to minimize any anxiety or threat. That means if the stereotype is an anxiety on them, fulfilling the, the stereotype actually is less uh, straining on their mind, because guess what? I'm doing what you expect me to do, right? So we can unintentionally encourage a stereotype that we've created for them. This is called a stereotype threat. This is another danger that can happen in the classroom. Um, how many of you have had students, and this is regardless of race or class, but you've had students, and let's be honest, we're administrators here, um, that seemed to be phenomenal students, but when they got in a particular classroom for some reason that year, they had a tough year. Something is going on where their performance level has dropped. All right, you guys are administrators. If that consistently happens to one of your faculty, students go in and their, their performance drops, what do you begin to think? That perhaps the faculty member is not as productive or not as effective in that particular age group or in that particular subject, right? Because it's not being communicated to the student. This is quite simply a micro situation with stereotype threat. The same thing is occurring to that student because something is occurring in the classroom 
then it's causing them to fulfill the lower expectation that is there. All right, so this is another result of implicit bias, one that is particularly uh, disconcerting for the environment in the classroom. Between now and the next time we meet, I'm going to send this cultural humility triangle to Kitty to send out to all of you. And what I would like to do is give you a homework assignment. When we talked about cultural humility, originally, remember we said that the first step in cultural humility is having a self-awareness, is self-evaluation, is self-critique. So the first part is self-awareness about how our own cultural beliefs and values interact with others that we encounter, all right? The second step is once you recognize your own, you have your own self-awareness, then you have a responsibility to inform those differences or educate yourself about those prejudices, about those biases and advocate for the balance, right, for equity. And your last step, particularly as an administrator, is then to hold your institution accountable for this developing this cultural humility in your schools. Along the way, each one of these steps, there's going to be questions that you should be asking yourselves. Those questions are, are mentioned there on both sides of the triangle. What I would like for you to do between now and the next time we meet, just spend a few minutes each day and not only self-evaluating yourself, but evaluate your institution and ask some of these questions that you see here, all right? When you're looking at, for example, when you're looking at, this is the holding your, holding systems accountable, holding your institution accountable. When you look at something like your PTA, honestly, sincerely look, does the parent teacher association match the enrollment or reflect the enrollment that I have in my school. And when I say reflect the enrollment, I don't mean um, just the color demographic. We mean the uh, economic demographic. We mean the uh, religious faith tradition demographic because even though we're Catholic institutions, we have a lot of families who are not Catholic who are attending our schools. Are they represented? This is just an example. In your hiring practices, are you pulling from the same well every single time that there's a position? Or are we actually trying to widen our uh, consideration for positions? These are all the type of questions that I would like for you to take an opportunity to do between now and the next time we meet. Try to have prepared when you come back the next time, some examples of what you noticed in honesty of the, how you wanted to move the needle, move it up into your school or your institution. What type of conversations were you having with teachers? Is there a way that you can help, help your faculty identify when there may be microaggressions happening in the classroom? Sometimes these microaggressions, I didn't mention this earlier, they could be nonverbal in the sense of the environment, the literal environment of the school, the imagery is in the school. All right, is every image of Jesus a white hair and blue eyed Jesus? All right, is every image of the Blessed Mother one with Eurocentric features? When you have students that have other, other uh, races in your institutions, right? Do we have accurate portrayals of the saints? Um, do we have opportunities to perhaps highlight saints that are not always, you know, not the, the, the first one. The, for example, I love St. Augustine, love St. Tom, Thomas Aquinas. I consider myself a Thomist. But at the same time, how often do we talk about Moses the Black, St. Benedict the Moor, right? Um, Father Augustus Tolton, who is currently has a cause for sainthood, Sister Thea Bowman, all these other future saints that are persons of color, all right? 
um, so that we can begin to demonstrate the humility that we're all keep coming here to learn about. I ended the session last time with reminding us of Jesus's words in his Sermon on the Mount, where he said, blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called the children of God. The word peace, shalom, means much more than just um, settling conflict. It means having right relationship with one another, as well as right relationship with God. In today's polarized society, the mission that you've been asked to do as leaders of institutions of education, of bringing people together, as opposed to having them drift apart, is not an easy task. Our Lord is calling us to live in right relationship, to be makers of peace, peacemakers. Developing and continuing our understanding of this culture of humility can help build us towards that goal. Thank you. I'm obviously opened up to, uh, as soon as I figure out how to stop sharing here, I am open to any questions or comments. Oh, there's a lot of chat that I didn't see. Okay, so I'm open to- hey, Carrie, I have a quick question. What would be the appropriateness? I know this was recorded of using this in like a faculty meeting or, you know, parts, is that, would that be appropriate to help start a conversation or? Yeah, you, I mean, you certainly, you're free obviously to use this in your faculty. I would, um, to keep, I guess, in most of my times in the past when I've done in services with, um, schools, this is a little bit more broader versus you, you know your staff and you know your environment that you're dealing with. What I would recommend is to use the videos that was used to stimulate the conversation in your institution. Does that make sense? Um, because then it could be much more personalized uh, to your institution. But obviously, any resources you want, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and I'm, I will give you uh, that resource. And you will see, you will receive the whole slide presentation. You will receive the slide presentation. So you'll have the information, you know, about the heuristics and, and all of that was all that's, that, that's there. You'll have that um, as part of your resources. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm thinking of, oh, go ahead, Josh. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks. I, I'm thinking of, uh, a lot uh, during this conversation about, uh, like, for instance, our second grade uh, first communion prep, you know, where it's a big deal. We're Blessed Sacrament School, so first communion prep is a big deal for us. Um, and we always have one or two children in that classroom who are non-Catholic. And so we've, we, you know, we've done some things to try to honor, you know, their faith traditions when it comes to Holy Communion and those kind of things. But, you know, I'm, given all of the information that you've given us today, I'm, I'm really sort of reflecting on, like, okay, have we have we really sort of, you know, I think you used the term, like, othered this person by calling attention to the fact of their non-Catholic status? Or, so, I don't know, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't know if I, this, I don't even have a question, more of the, just wanted to share that I'm sort of wrestling a little bit with this, and as we approach this season again, because we're getting ready to begin doing those, those things again in our school, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or some some guidance, but I'm wrestling with. There are schools that I think do that do they handle that probably better than others. Um, one of the things that in the schools that um, I've seen do it well is that there's no. So the lesson of this, I'm, I'm the constant evangelization evangelization guy, right? So to me, I see a student who was in your your second or third grade class getting ready for you're getting ready for first uh, communion who was not Catholic. 
I see that as an opportunity for evangelization, right? So as long as you're not othering them in the any the preparation, sure, but in the actual lesson of what is about to occur, you can actually develop, they can develop an appreciation and actually go back home asking their parents who are not Catholic about it. Because what do students want to do? They want to do, they have a group mentality, right? They don't want to be sectioned out. They want to, they want to belong with everyone else. Um, we have several students in the Diocese of Cleveland who, with their parents' permission, have um, actually converted <laughs> into the faith through going to school at the church, right? The parents um, were not Catholic, but it was an opportunity that they saw and, and you know, they were evangelized and they came in. So as long as I think you include them in everything that you possibly could and lean on their, what appreciation they do have of the faith. And what I mean by, I don't mean the Catholic faith, I mean the Christian faith, right? I think of several students who are African-American students, they may not be Catholic, but they are very much, they know church, right? They know, they, they go to church every Sunday. Um, I'll be honest with you, most African-American families are much more passionate about going to church on Sunday. Um, sorry, then, then, we, then, <laughs> then we are as, <laughs> as Catholics, I'll be real. You know, I, I know a lot of families that was happy when we went to remote. Oh, we can't go to bed. Hey, I ain't got a problem. I'm, I'm okay. Right. It's unfortunate. Um, but so, I mean, use that. I mean, that's the best thing I can, I can say. Hey, Carrie, we talk about the fact that uncomfortable conversations have to happen in order for progress to be made. But how do we strike a balance between being vulnerable with our students and even our faculty about our implicit biases and our microaggressions without making it more controversial or uncomfortable for people? Well, the first thing, I'm gonna say with students, um, you're not gonna walk up to a student and say, I'm working on my microaggressions today. Please let me know if I offend you, right? You're not, that's, that's not what we're doing here. It's a self-evaluation, right? So you are constantly reading signals. If you say something, let's be honest, and you see the child, if they're uncomfortable, you're, you're going to see a reaction from it, all right? You do a mental check. In the, the one video, the gentleman who walked up to the young lady and said, you did an excellent job on that test, I was surprised. Well, the next time he walked up and said, even if he was surprised, okay, what did he say? You did an excellent job on that test and I knew you could do it, right? We have to make an intention to change our language. Um, I think that's the first, that, that's the first thing. You know, Carrie, I, I struggle a little bit um, at our school. Um, not, haven't had a whole lot of diversity in years past, and so we're really working hard to uh, to, to, to welcome uh, Latino people, Latino um Right there, that was an incorrect statement. Latino people, sorry. So uh, uh, members of the uh, Latino culture. So, so with that, you know, like we had a bilingual mass yesterday. All right, and and the people that we chose to, um, or we elected uh, three of our bilingual students to read. They were there. They, they did the, uh, the the readings and the responsorial psalms and so forth. But but even today, I'm thinking like, oh, you know, here I thought we were kind of. Um, putting them in, in this role of a leadership so so they 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 they're included in things but it, it, you know it, it, is that causing is that causing a division or is that causing is, is that the unification that we, that that we is that the way to to help unify the, those kids in our school to help them feel part of a positive culture and part of everything we want here at, at, at IC so i don't know i guess i'm okay first um i'm, I'm going to say this and i say this all with love um, the white community tends to overthink it. Okay, look, you, you, now this is, this is the only thing I would do differently and I don't know whether you did it or not. The inclusion part is going up to the students and you say, this is the vulnerability part. You're actually showing vulnerability as you say, we plan or we are planning a mass, a bilingual mass. Um, I need help. So you're, you're saying I need help would you feel comfortable helping me with the mask? 
that's what you start off with. Now you may have already have in your mind what you want them to do, but you're including them in the conversation, in the planning of the mass. That's the inclusion part, right? And then if they say, oh yeah, I would love to help. Well, it's bilingual. Um, would you mind reading? If they say you're getting their affirmation, they're saying yes. It's when you tell them. That's what the microaggression part is. When you say, oh, we're having a bilingual mash. Um, I need you to do the reading because it's in Spanish. And I know you know Spanish. That's the microaggression because then, hold on, you're making an assumption that he's even comfortable doing it. He or she is even comfortable. Do, do you see what I'm saying, Colleen? I don't know Absolutely. if that, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So the inclusion, the important part is not the actual event. The important part is the time leading up to it. That's why it's, it's an environmental piece. Good, good. Okay, so that is kind of how I did it, which is good. So I mean, so um, so so what other what other things can you recommend then for for a school who who is who is is venturing down there? What other things can we do as a school? Because the culture is huge. That that's a huge part for, for inclusivity. And any any recommend any recommendations for us? That how do we continue that? The first thing, as I mentioned before, is actually the nonverbals are the most powerful. And what I mean by that is something as simple as um, ensuring throughout the year that there is an effort. I mean, we have, I think, some 4,000 saints on the books, right? So yeah. we have saints of every culture on this planet. We need to look at opportunities to highlight those saints. Not in, hold on. So here's an example. Don't do uh, St. Moses the Black only in February, okay? Because that's called tokenism. One thing that will frustrate communities of color more than anything else is this idea of tokenism. Tokenism means, okay, we're going to give you a little time because this is the month that the world has given to you, and then it never comes up again until your next time, right? That's tokenism. Um you want to have an environment. So you want to, throughout the year, highlight. You're not highlighting the saint because they are of, of a saint of color. You're just highlighting the holiness of the saint before the people seeing it, they, rec they will recognize, mm -hmm. all right? Their own culture is part of this cloud of saints, right, that, that, we, that, that are part of our celebration. That's one piece. Um, it could be, again, images throughout the school, yeah. okay. right? Okay. That's not, again, we're not highlighting it. It's just kind of subtly planted in the school. Then it's part of the environment. Though it's very small things. Yeah. Um, again, I go back to tokenism. What, I made this comment about the PTA or your hiring practices, um, especially if you ask any, any community of color to be part of a committee use them, include them. Don't have them come on the committee and everybody and all the old heads are still making the decisions and they're not even being added. They're just on there to check a box that we have a diverse committee. That's tokenism. And that actually is a microaggression. So when you, it's more, one thing I said to um, the rector of our seminary up here in Cleveland is that, you know, he's pushing, just like they always do, for vocation, we want a diverse enrollment. And I always say, Enrollment is one thing. You can have a diverse enrollment and still not be a culturally mm -hmm. inclusive school, right? Because simply having someone on the enrollment books is not the same thing as creating an environment um, of cultural humility. So we want to make sure that that's, uh, you know, all part of our development. In our school. Okay, thank you. Harry, uh, uh, along those lines, uh, you know, I think, first of all, uh, the the opportunity in September now, today as well, the opportunity for growth uh, is fantastic. So we appreciate your time. But question that I would have, you know, not only with regard to working with our faculty, uh, but also working with our, with our young people. Uh, and I know, you, you know, to start with, uh, you know, with uh, the, the folks that are in leadership, our, our kind of thought and process, I'm at a, at a high school here in Columbus, 
uh, would be to, you know, certainly start with our faculty, our administration, but also to bring in student leaders as well um, to really make an impact from a cultural standpoint in terms of change. Uh, because I think uh, uh, students are also oftentimes the product of their environment, both here at school and at home. And so uh, to, to bring about, you know, uh, sustained change, uh, it, you have to dig a little bit deeper. And sometimes that means that, you know, you go, it's outreach within your community. And so I, I would be interested in some point in having a conversation offline with regard to your thoughts you can share with the whole group now though, you know, programmatic uh, ideas for, for, your student, for your students as well. One thing that I've seen <clears throat> happen and, and occur, when you have, um, what, so let's say you have events where you have, I don't know, professionals come in to speak to the student body about whatever, you know, event you wanna uh, talk about. Maybe those professionals, are you actually have to go out and find a professional that's other than your typical, for example, white businessman, right? Or your typical white doctor. Go and look and find someone who is of Hispanic descent or African-American and have them, you're not highlighting them, right? That, well, we brought in a black doctor. No, 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 you're just bringing in a doctor. And what you're doing is, is you are providing to those students, someone in front of them that is a professional, those images that I mentioned that we don't see very often, you're actually see, they're able to see that in front of them. One thing about communities of color, they're very communal. And so a lot of studies have been shown that certain sectors of, we'll say um, employment, certain sectors of study, they're, their very limited representation of certain community of certain demographics. Why? Because they never saw them anywhere in their demographic in that role, right? So they don't attain it. One huge thing in the cath in the church right now, Catholic Church, is is vocations, the priesthood. The reason why we have such a small number, and to give you an idea, just so you know, there's forty thousand priests in our country. Guess how many are African American? 250, 250 out of 40,000 priests. Why? Because most African-American Catholics don't see an African-American priest. So they don't see themselves in that role. So then I think that's one thing you can do. If you want to motivate your students, have them start to interact with those in the community that who are in you know, fields that they may be interested in but they don't see. It's going to take intention on you, you know, to, to find that. Um, but obviously, you're in Columbus. It's out there. Um, and another thing, it's easy to fall back on to have the motivating speaker be the athlete um, or the entertainer. And while I have nothing, I got two. I got two sons right now playing Division One football. Uh, love them, but. That's not all <laughs> that, that can be there uh, in front of the students. Does that make sense, Dan? And we can obviously hit me up and we can talk um, offline as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So I, um, something else that you had said um, and I kind of keyed into was um, the special special needs mm -hmm. individuals. And I see a lot of teachers over like overcompensating almost in terms of helping them. And it it tends to give them that message that they can't do it themselves. However, I mean, they've been identified with special needs, so they obviously need help. Can you talk about like the balance there. So I'm going to I'm going to switch my hat real quick because in addition to working with the diocese I also teach at Walsh University um, in the theology department. Now, obviously higher education is quite a bit is, is different 
than um, high school and the grammar schools. But one of the things that makes um, working with students with disabilities so effective in higher ed is that the instructors are given what the um, accommodations are, but the instructors are not the ones who enforce them. It's the student that does, right? So this, again, it's all part of that inclusion piece. So even though, for example, I may have a student that says they are, um, they should get twice the amount of time to do an exam. Well, obviously that means they're not doing the exam in class because everyone else, I'm not having that amount of time. But it's on them, it's up to them. I have the accommodations, but then they say, you know what, I don't need the extra time, right? So um, now granted, the unfortunate part about, <laughs> especially when you get into grammar school is, are they saying it, are they, are they having the cafeteria thing? Like, oh, you know what? Today, I want the extra time, um, but <laughs> other times I, I don't, right? But again, it's still that conversation. It's the inclusion with the student. I think that's the best way to have a balance is if you include the student in that conversation. And if they're incredibly young, include the parent. Um, because the parent will also give you, I mean, parents want their kids to succeed, right? So the, the parent will also give you an understanding, you know what, they can do this. Or um, this is this is the part because you know we tend to have a wider the accommodations are this big when really it may just be one part that the student has a you know had a, has a harder time with this is a I think this is an example of having to have conversation with the, with the family and with the student if they're old enough obviously within the parameters of whatever the guidelines are for the diocese of Columbus which I have no idea what they are. But at some level, there should be conversation um, happening between the student and the instructor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I will put um, in the chat for everyone to see even though i believe you all have it but i will put my email in the chat if anyone has any questions want to do a follow-up wait a minute what dice i work for a oh, cleveland okay uh, <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's spelled right so that is my contact information um Please do not hesitate to use it and reach out. I said that last time and only had two reach out to me. So um, in this in this 60 on here. So please use me, uh, reach out if you got any questions. I can't come down every week, but uh, I can't answer questions uh, and be as much of a resource as I possibly can. Was that .org? Yes. Thank you. Dioceseofcleveland.org. All right, Carrie, thank you so much for, for all of this today. This was a wonderful uh, presentation and just tremendous information that, that we're very grateful for. So thank you very much for your time and, and for joining us. And we will see you again uh, this spring. Uh, but uh, you know, I hope that you and your family have a very wonderful and very Merry Christmas and, uh, and get some rest over, over the break. Um, thanks, Carrie.